The LA Clippers made it seven out of our last eight games with a win. And this one came without James Harden. And we had Russell Westbrook start for the first time since November 14th. And how about Russell Goatbrook showing up? Triple double in the Valley of the Sun. 3-0 and on the season against the Suns. How do we do it? How do we close the game and withstand the Phoenix push? And with the way we are playing, 7-1 in our last eight, are we ready for the playoffs? Going to be talking about it all on today's Locked On Clippers. You are Locked On Clippers, your daily Los Angeles Clippers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, sir. You are locking in with the clips. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers the first listen of your day, your team every day. I'm your host, Darian Viziri, born and raised in LA and in my 19th season as a Clipper fan. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod and subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, where I went live directly after the Clipper game to talk about all of the games in LA sports on the night. And Locked On Clippers is free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. And I want you to let me know what you thought of Russell Westbrook's performance. What did you think of the differences in how the team played with Russ at the controls? And I'm going to be talking about that, the way we closed the game and withstood the Phoenix Suns push. And, of course, just how we're playing overall lately, 7-1 and one in our last eight games. And before we get started, this episode is brought to you by Game Time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Just download the app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Clipper Nation. Before this game started, we heard that Kawhi Leonard would be out yet again. Now I'm starting to get a little worried. I heard everything was okay. It seems like the organization's saying they're not worried. But he has been out for five straight games. I'm hoping he plays the final three to ramp him up for the playoffs. Now, James Harden, he traveled with the team. Remember, we're playing Phoenix again on Wednesday night. James Harden traveled with the team. He was questionable to play in the last game. Obviously sat out a lot of that second half when he made that run. And he was deemed out with a sore foot or foot inflammation. So, Russell Westbrook got the opportunity to start. For the first time since that game against the Denver Nuggets in Denver on November 14th, he got to start, and just like I expected, once you give Russell Westbrook the keys and give him an extended leash, extended playing time where he knows he's getting minutes, he then becomes the best version of himself. And all season long, when we were even when we were playing our best basketball, when I heard people say this is the perfect role for Russ, I always disagreed. The perfect role for Russ is not the bench role. The perfect role for Russ where you maximize him is when you guarantee him about 25 to 30 minutes or 20 to 30, I should say. Because sometimes Russ can be detrimental. I mean, sometimes he just goes way too fast. He's out of control. He's turning the ball over. But my thing with Russ is, and if, the, if he were the starting point guard this year and had we not traded for Harden, I doubt our record would have been as good. But I will say this. To me, there's still more good than bad with Russell Westbrook. But when you use him the way we have as a bench player, at times he comes in and just tries to press, just tries to show how impactful he can be. And in those short minutes, he just tries to score and doesn't do what we kind of brought him in to do initially, which was set the table, be the point guard that 2-1-3 didn't have. Now, we kind of said, you know what? The point guard that 2-1-3 didn't have is James Harden. You come off the bench to back James Harden up. But when you see Russell Westbrook start, he distributes the ball. He looks to get guys going when he brings it up the court. But what really changes is our defense and our athleticism and our speed. Everything we were doing was faster in this game. From moving the ball to how quickly we got the ball up the floor to the way we transitioned from defense into offense, everything had more pep in its step. And it starts in the beginning when you have Russell Westbrook guarding Kevin Durant, Terrence Mann on Devin Booker, PG on Beal, Zoo on Ebanks, Eubanks, I'm sorry, and Norman Powell, who started in place of Kawhi Leonard on Grayson Allen. Now, what stands out there? And, of course, Zoo in drop coverage. 
What stands out there? Russell Westbrook guarding KD. He has this vendetta. You know, he has that chip on his shoulder when he plays against Kevin Durant. We saw it last year in the playoffs. He was doing the same thing again, active chasing over screens. You have Paul George guarding their number three option. You have our number one point of attack defender guarding Devin Booker. And the first quarter was just one for the ages. Russell Westbrook was everywhere. Everything he was touching was turning to gold. He had two interceptions that led to dunks. He was getting downhill. And Paul George got going. They were hedging on PG with Eubanks in the pick and roll. And reminder, the Suns' weakness is their center rotation. And they're missing their starting center. So Drew Eubanks coming out hedging and recovering. We were getting some good stuff with Zoo in the short roll. And Terrence Mann... You see, and you've been seeing it lately, and I've been mentioning it, he has been hindered by James Harden this year, and I'm going to explain why. When he's playing with James Harden, what he gets more of than ever before is the open catch-and-shoot three in the corner. He's gotten more of those than ever before. But Terrence Mann thrives in a more fast-paced environment, in in an environment where he can get downhill and showcase his best ability, which is driving, driving to the basket hard, going into someone's body and laying it up with that right hand. He has more of an opportunity to do that with Russell Westbrook playing at that fast pace and showcasing his athleticism. And what it also does is you have Terrence and Russ playing together defensively alongside a PG or a Kawhi or both, and it just feels like more athleticism, bodies flying around, arms flying around, and attacking, I'm sorry, running guys off the three-point line faster and that transition from defense to offense faster. And I'll say this about Terrence, you know, one thing about him when he cuts When James Harden's isolating at the top of the key and everyone's loading up and Terrence has come to the basket, but you still have a big out there, that pass, if Harden throws it from the top of the key, NBA players are so athletic and long, whoever's guarding Ivica Zubas can just rotate across the key and get a deflection on that pass. But when Russ is driving downhill and Terrence Mann's cutting baseline, a lot of times the defense can't really recover on the ball handler Russ and the recipient of the pass, Terrence, because... That pass is being made on a shorter distance because Russ is driving to the basket. He's already in the paint, so that drop off to the baseline cut is a lot closer. So I just feel as though Terrence Mann and Russell Westbrook's chemistry is better. Not to say that Terrence Mann has been bad with James Harden, but I think it just favors his style better. And we were just everywhere in that first quarter. Paul George had eight points in the—I'm sorry, I think it was seven. No, 13 points in the first quarter. Where did I get seven from? 13 points in the first quarter. Terrence Mann had seven points and six rebounds in the first quarter, and those are the two guys that played the whole thing. And then Russ had six points, five boards, and four assists in the first quarter. And on the flip side, the Suns were missing everything. I mean everything. Devin Booker had the most uncharacteristic game I've ever seen him have. He looked like he didn't even care. Missing layups. Kevin Durant missed two free throws. KD was getting locked up. I thought Zoo did a good job contesting and drop coverage at times. Thought Amir Coffey had some amazing defensive possessions. Obviously, Russell Westbrook did a pretty good job. And we were up 37 to 10 at the end of the first quarter. We shot 65% from the field and 80 from three in the first. And they shot just 10.5% in the first. I mean, it was an absolute beatdown, a crazy statement. Uh, As far as their matchups, they had Grayson guarding Norman Powell, Beal guarding Russ, Drew Eubanks on Ivica Zubats, KD on Paul George, and Booker on Terrence Mann. But it was really the Russell Westbrook show in that first half. He was just everywhere. Even was given space to shoot a three, stepped into a mid-range pull-up and made it. And as the game went on, you know, in the second quarter, he was also doing some great things as well, continuing to do great things. And one thing I loved, he was throwing entry passes to Zoo. A lot of times, Zoo would come down the floor, seal deep, and Russ would throw him the ball. And while Zoo doesn't have the same pick-and-roll threat with James Harden, not out there, Russ might, because he's not as good of an offensive playmaker as Harden right now, he more often looks to throw Zoo the ball in the post, and that's what we definitely want to see for Zoo's development. But, yeah, the Suns are missing everything. Second quarter was kind of a trading basket situation. We went with our bench. Amir played super well when he came in. Two threes, playing really good defense. Bones Highland even had seven points, but I thought he was good in the first half but not good in the second Um, And it was just the worst I'd ever seen Devin Booker play. I mean, nothing went right for him. Nothing went right for them. And Terrence, Russ, Amir, and Zoo were just amazing in the first half. And at halftime, we were up 66-33. to And it ended up being just too big of a deficit 
for the Suns to overcome. You know, they made a push. They got the game within seven, but we did a good job of closing it out. I just think the overall takeaway for me, that first half, Russell Westbrook had nine points, eight rebounds, and 12 assists in the first half and two steals. I mean, it's just amazing. And then you have Zubats with a double level in the first half, 13 and 10. Just, they set a tone. And despite the fact that the second half wasn't necessarily pretty, we got outscored in both quarters, particularly the fourth, I'm sorry, the third. And we got outscored by 20 in the second half. And Russ, you know, I obviously made this segment centered around Russ, but in the second half, he wasn't very good. He was three for 11. He was starting to get out of control, starting to get a little lazier on defense, turning the ball over. He had seven points and seven boards and three assists in the third in the second half, which sounds good. But he had three turnovers, and he was 3 for 11 from the field in the second half. So it wasn't all sunshine and roses. Part of the reason why we fell off was definitely Russell, partially on Russ. But overall, we got the win. And it just makes you think, like, we got the win 105-92. Russell Westbrook was the player of the game. And it's funny because he had never had a season where he hadn't gotten a triple-double. And it was looking like we were going to have a season where he didn't. You give him the starting role. We just talked about James Harden having three triple-doubles this season. Russell Westbrook got one just like that. It, with Halfway through the third quarter, he got it. So again, for all the people that think Russell Westbrook sucks, that Russell Westbrook couldn't have done a great job leading this team if we didn't have Harden. Again, I'm not saying he could have done better. I'm not saying our team is better without Harden. I just think it gives us a different look. A look that's more defensive-minded, a little faster. And depending on what you think is best for the team, that's up for debate. But this is what Russell Westbrook can still do, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you know that. And we're seeing it. And it just further shows Ty Lue, and it should show Ty Lue, we shouldn't be super married to one or the other in the playoffs. If one situ- if one of them isn't playing great, we got the other. And that's the luxury of this team. But Russell Westbrook's overall stats in the game, 16 points, 15 boards, 15 assists, two steals on 7 for 17 shooting, 2 for 4 from 3. How about that? Somehow did not get any free throws. But he did have five turnovers, and that's the one thing with Russ you're going to have to live with, but you also need him to limit. I mean, we had 21 turnovers in the game and still won by 13, but that's part of the reason why we allowed the Suns back in it is because we got so careless with the ball, and that's partially on Russ. But he's my player of the game, huge performance, huge win without Kawhi, without Harden, 105 to 92 in the Valley of the Sun. That was our last road game of the season. But coming up, the Suns did make a push. Why did it get so close, and how do we withstand it? Going to be talking about that coming up. I got to tell you a little something about game time. You know, there was one time where my mom wanted to go to a game, and it was just very last minute, or even the game four of the conference finals in 2021. I needed a ticket last minute. I didn't know if I was going to go, but last last second I was like, I got to be there, man. I got to be there for the guys. Game time, if that had existed at the time, I would have been in luck because game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, game time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB and NBA tickets. Save up to 60% buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, and theater with Game Time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N B A for $20 off. Download the Game Time app, last minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. All right, Clippers winning this one, 105-92 in the Valley of the Sun. We have now won seven out of our last eight games after our worst stretch of the season. Win number 51 on the season out of 79 games, which you know what that means. It means that this L.A. Clippers team has tied the 2016-17 Clippers for the fifth best record in franchise history, and that deserves applause in the chat, Clipper Nation. Let's go. 51-31. and 31. Now, that 2017 season was a lot more frustrating than this one. We had a lot of injuries. CP3, Blake. There was even this portion of the season where we had Blake, JJ, and CP3 all out at the same time. I remember we started out so well that season, too. That was the crazy part. We started out like 12-2. and two. 
And then Blake got hurt after a game against Washington. CP3 had a, like a wrist or hand injury like he always does. And we stumbled into the playoffs with the four seed. Then Blake got hurt again against Utah. If we win one more game, and I think we will, we will have sole possession of that fifth best record in Clipper history. And if we get two more wins in these last three games, we will tie the 2016 Clippers, which, again, I have no idea how we were able to get 53 wins that year. It was a down year for the West outside of OKC, San Antonio, and Golden State. But Blake Griffin missed, if I'm not mistaken, 57 games that year. Or no, 47 games that year with that one, the quad injury, and then that stupid punching of the trainer that caused him to miss almost the, or over half the season. But, wow, 51 wins, man. It feels good. Kawhi Leonard has played in 68 games, so he has missed 11 on the year. Paul George has played in 73 games. I mean, does it get better? The most games played on our team is Norman Powell with 74. We got the Suns left, we got the Jazz left, and we got the Rockets left. Paul George can hit 75 games. I think he should rest personally tomorrow or on Wednesday because why not? Hopefully we get Kawhi or Paul, uh, Harden back. But let's talk about how the Suns kind of came back in this game. So a lot of it was just complacency. You know, we were lethargic with the ball, throwing the ball away, and just went cold. And one of the reasons why we went cold is because Kevin Durant was guarding Paul George. And Paul, his big advantage over guys is that he's quicker than the tall guys and he's taller than most wings and guards. KD is the original shoot over the top length, shifty, big wing guy. So the advantage for Paul George isn't super there. Of course, as I said, he was still running pick and rolls. Drew Eubanks was hedging and recovering. But KD, when he was guarding him, he didn't actually want much of a part of KD. And in the second quarter, PG was 0 for 1. Third quarter, he was 1 for 5. So in quarters 2 and 3, Paul George had a combined 2 points. So he actually wasn't even doing that much. It was really the rust show. And in the third quarter, we shot just 32% from the field and 22 from three pg one for five russ two for nine norm one for four and then bones was zero for two so outside of terrence mann who played the whole quarter alongside russ and he had four points on two for two shooting everybody else didn't shoot very well and zubats was two for two in that quarter but everyone else didn't shoot really well and a big change. So the Suns went on an 8-0 run right away. A lot of it was just that the Clippers were cold. And once we went cold, you know, the Suns got some rebounds, get out in transition, catch a slip in. We're also, in, you know, cross-matched. So and if you don't know what cross-matched means, that means when a team comes down in transition and the closest guy just picks up the ball and now you have a mismatch because you weren't able to recover to your original guys in time. Russ, as I mentioned earlier, got his triple-double midway through the third quarter. And for the rest of the game, we started seeing more small ball on both sides. The Clippers went with a lineup of Russell Westbrook, Terrence Mann, Amir Coffey, Paul George, and Bones Highland at one point, and it did not work. It was very short-lived. Uh, Mason Plumley, who, by the way, played over Daniel Tice in this game. Again, that carousel of big men. Who does he go with? He keeps switching one out. Mason played in this game, but he only played in the first half, and he gave eight minutes of production, two points, a donut. Both of them were free throws, so I don't really have much to say about Mason. But there was one point in that third quarter. We went with that small lineup, and it wasn't that pretty. You know, it wasn't much resistance. Then the Suns responded with a small lineup of their own with KD at the five. KD at the five, and then at times Royce O'Neal at the five so they're going with a switch everything kind of scheme and it was kind of working i mean they were staying in front of the ball paul george wasn't creating much going downhill you know russ is not the same one-on-one -on -one scorer these days but for them and so russ was going too fast missing layups turning it over bones was just over dribbling on offense and not really creating advantages so the third quarter the suns outscored us 35 to 18 it wasn't pretty at all, and they started getting hot from three. 
So after being down 33, they outscored us by 17 in the third, going into the fourth quarter down 16. And they got it all the way down to seven. PG was getting no calls, and you can see with the difference in free throws, I thought the Suns got a better whistle than us. They shot 28 free throws in the game. We only shot 11. So the funny part is that the Suns shot more field goals and free throws than us, and they still lost because we turned the ball over so much. But they shot just 34% from the field in the game, 23% from three, 86% from the line. So they did shoot up from the line, but from the field in three, they were terrible. And then we shot 47% from the field and 46% from three. And a second straight game where we shot 100% from the line, which is awesome, but only 11 attempts. So 11 for 11, you'll absolutely take that. But the sun started getting a little hot in the fourth quarter, making some threes. Let me see what they shot from three in the fourth quarter. Wow, they didn't even shoot. Wow, it's amazing. They didn't shoot well from three in the fourth either. 38% from the field, 18% from three, but they were making a run. They made a couple of shots in a row. But, you know, the one guy that couldn't hit with shot after shot he got, open shot, was Grayson Allen. There were times where, and he's the leading, the league leader in three-point percentage. Had he made a couple of big shots, would have changed a lot of the momentum of the game, but he could not make anything. Now, the Clippers went with Zubats against Phoenix's small ball lineup for a while. And while the Suns were getting open threes because Zubats had to close out and he was not really getting out there, we, our advantage is Zubats in the post, right? And this is what I've been calling for. Zub get the ball in the post. Well, I have to say, it didn't look very good. The Suns players, their guards, their wings, they did a pretty good job of pushing Zubats out further. And again, I do believe that the contact in the post is just not called as much these days. I think they're they're stricter with the perimeter stuff but and face-up guys, but post-up guys just let dudes put two hands on the back all of a sudden now. And it's just it's very whack. But Zubas getting pushed too far out of the paint. So he needs to be a little bit stronger there. But I also think Jim Jackson made a good point in commentary. When the ball was just sticking... And we couldn't, we were afraid to throw Zoo an entry pass. We got to move the ball to both sides of the half court so then Zoo can move around and change the angle or work the angle to potentially receive a pass. Now, when he got the ball, he got double teamed. And then you saw him, you know, slow to react to the double team. And then the Suns have quickness on the court now so they can attack, not attack closeouts. They can close out and run us off the line and it becomes a little more complex. So Ty kind of lost faith in that. And went with our smaller lineup again with Amir, PG, Terrence, Russ, and Norm. And Paul George, moral of the story, he closed. He closed big. He drove and kicked to Amir Coffee for a three to put us up 86-76 when the crowd was going really loud. And mind you, he did have four turnovers in the fourth. And it was really risky. I mean, Paul, you know that's going to be there. The turnover brothers, he and Russ. But Paul needs to take better care of the ball. We know that. But when they cut it to seven... PG stayed aggressive. He had that step back over Grayson Allen. They started double teaming him. And then he found Russ for a beautiful cut when they doubled him late to make it 103 to 90. And then we had it. Paul George had 21 points, 23 points in the game, seven rebounds and five assists, one steal and one block. But he did have six turnovers, which is not good. He shot well, though, seven for 15 from the field, three for five from three, and six for six from the line in 39 minutes. He played the whole second half against Cleveland at a game winner, had 39 minutes in this game, eight points in the fourth. He's been closing really well lately. I think he deserves a rest, but I'm so happy for Paul. The way he's playing going into the playoffs, you could not ask for better as a Clipper fan. And coming up, going to talk about the team. We had our roughest stretch of the season, 7-1 and in our last eight. What does it mean with the playoffs? on the horizon gonna be talking about that coming up this next segment is brought to us by our sponsor better help sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest big or small certain things can really start to get to you it's important to let that out especially to someone who's unbiased on your life so today i want to say how i really feel about something you might even be thinking about the same thing this week I think Russell Westbrook might be more built to help us in the playoffs than James Harden. I think because he'll play much better defense and he'll do the intangible things that win you games. And when James Harden's pick and roll threat isn't there, I am still nervous about how he's going to do well for us. But here's the thing. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team. And it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. 
It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. All right, Clippers winning this one, 105 to 92. We have now finished our season on the road, 26 and 15 away from home this season. That's really good. I just don't like that our home record has slipped so much. That's what I don't like. But, wow, 26 and 15 on the road. The Suns are 25 and 16 at home. We've got a better road record than they have a home record. God, I wish we could play the Suns first round, get the revenge that we always deserved. We did a good job keeping their guys at bay. KD, 8 for 22 in the game. A lot of it was just them missing shots, though, I can't lie. Um, Bradley Beal, 6 for 13. I didn't even notice him until the second half. Devin Booker was 1 for 11. It's just unbelievable after the way he played against us in the playoffs and how he usually does. He, was, he, didn't look, he didn't even look like he wanted to be out there. It was so wild. But Clippers are now 7-1 and one in our last eight. We're starting to play better, but here's my thing. It's never bad to be winning games, but the truest version of the Clippers is with Kawhi. Without Kawhi, it's hard to judge. Now, which one of these wins have been good? At Orlando was a very good win against a solid team. There, I predict, though, it's not even a prediction. It's a fact. We're going to be playing a better team in the first round than Orlando. No offense to them. They're having an amazing season. The win against Denver was great. They didn't have Jamal Murray. That's very relevant. We didn't have Kawhi, though. But again, doesn't like the Nuggets without Murray versus the Clippers without Kawhi doesn't actually tell us anything about what the playoffs are going to look like. It's more about let's get James Harden, Paul George, and certain guys playing well going into the playoffs for their own confidence. And then this win was... Awesome. I mean, it was against the pretty much fully healthy Suns, but they didn't have Nurkic. We didn't have Kawhi or Harden. Huge win. So here's what I'll say. We aren't going into the, in the playoffs playing awful basketball. We have three very winnable games to end at home coming up. For all we know, we could be 10-1 and one going into the playoffs. And that still wouldn't make me super confident that we're going to make it past uh, the conference finals or even past the second round. But I, I still believe what I said. I think we can make it to the conference finals. Any further than that, I don't know. Now, here's my thing, right? So, as I said, 7-1 in our last eight. Part of that is because Terrence Mann is playing really good ball. Like in this game, 8 for 10 from the field for him. Amazing, right? 17 and 10. Only one three-point attempt and made it. 38 minutes played. Still not a great defensive game for him, though. Good defensive first half. Second half, not great. Zubats is also playing some of his best basketball of the season. Six straight double-doubles for him, 17-13 and 13 in this game with two assists and two blocks on 8-for-13 shooting in 28 minutes. Zoo is playing great, and we need that. I already mentioned Paul and Russ. Norm Powell had 10 points, even though he didn't shoot well from the field. 4-for-12, 33%. 2-for-4 from 3, only one turnover, and he was a plus 25, and that's not coincidence. I mean, the stuff that Norm brings you every night, double-digit scoring, floor spacing, attacking closeouts better than anybody on the team. So, he, again, my sixth man of the year, Norman Powell. Let's get some sixth man of the year comments for Norm. And then off the bench, we went eight deep. Mason, who only played one half. Bones played seven, had seven points and nine rebounds and two assists. I'll take the nine rebounds, but not great to me. Three for nine from the field, one for four from three in 17 minutes. Just too much dribbling. And then Amir Coffey, I thought he was awesome. Really good defense on KD at times. 13 points, four, four rebounds, two assists, two steals. No turnovers on 4 for 11 shooting and 3 for 8 from 3. Just a big contribution from everywhere from the guys. And we win it 105 to 92. But Zubats, Terrence playing their some of their best ball before the playoffs. It's going to be a big test for Amir. You know, his first playoffs as a rotation player. And then you have Paul who's playing amazing. Harden's playing a little better. Russ just had one of his best games of the season, if not the best. So we're starting to look better. The thing is we just haven't seen the whole gang together in a little bit. So that's what you want to see in these last three games. You get Kawhi back tomorrow. You end the last two games of the full gang. I'm feeling really good. When I say really good, I mean that we can win that first round series. After that, we'll see. Because here's the thing. Minnesota and Denver have one more game against each other, and they're tied right now. If the Denver Nuggets are first, we'd be playing them second round if we beat Dallas, which is most likely going to be the series. Which is going to be a nightmare, and we'll do a whole bunch of previews about that as well. We beat Dallas. And by the way, I watched one of their full games against Sacramento, and it was a little encouraging as a Clipper fan, even though the Mavericks won. Even if we beat Dallas, if we play Denver second round, we're in trouble. 
Here's the thing, though. If we play Minnesota second round, we're also kind of in trouble based on the regular season matchup, but we are a more experienced team. If we play the Lakers, let's say the Lakers somehow make it. Now we are have home court, but we don't really have home court. So it would be kind of annoying. We be a disaster if we lose. But then again, we're playing at a ninth seed or eighth, eighth, ninth, or tenth seed in the second round of a playoff series. So that'll be interesting to talk about. But if we're Clipper fans, which we are, we want Minnesota to get number one because it looks like we're going to be number four. If we beat Dallas in the first round, we have a chance to beat Minnesota. Then the big bad wolf in the conference finals. And if we've built the momentum to play them in the conference finals, well, so I'm, I'm saying if we have the momentum going by making it to the conference finals, that's our best chance of being Denver is if we're playing that well of basketball that we're there. But let's take it one round at a time, right? Denver Nuggets in the conference finals. That would be insane. Absolutely insane. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod. Subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, for even more LA Clipper and LA sports content. And Locked On Clippers. And by the way, yeah, check my live after the game directly after. Talk to all things LA sports. And, of course, Locked On Clippers is free and available wherever you get your podcast. Hope you enjoyed the win. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Let me know what you thought of the difference with Russ playing this many minutes as opposed to Harden. And anything you want to say about the episode or the game. By the way, I did see some of those comments. I'm going to respond to them. Um, thank you guys so much. For some of the kind words you guys said in the last episode, responding to what I said about the people that I don't hear from. I appreciate you all. Greatest fan base in the world. Love you. It's almost time for the best time of the year. The age-old proverb continues. Go Clippers. And with that win, we've clinched and won the division for the first time in 10 years. Hallelujah. We have clinched the division. While we don't put up those banners, it's nice to hear for the first time since 2014. The age-old proverb continues. Go division-winning Clippers.